It was Frederick Nietzsche, the great philosopher of the 19th century, who first announced to the world that God is dead. The theistic, external, supernatural, invasive God is dead. No one listened. The world responded by treating Nietzsche as if he were either mad or had become just incapable of understanding reality. So we published a little, a little bit of doggerel that said, God is dead, Nietzsche. Nietzsche is dead, God. And we thought that answered the problem. And so this understanding of God, the traditional understanding as a dying reality, was submerged. It came back into our life in the 1960s when a group of theologians, people like Thomas J.J. J. Allheiser, William Hamilton, Paul Van Buren, formed a school of thought that was called the God is Dead Theology. It made the cover of Time magazine in the 1960s. And we produced people like John A.T. Robinson in England and James A. Pike in America, people from within the church who began to say that the way we understand God and human life are simply no longer operative. But once again, the world wasn't ready to hear. And so bumper stickers dismissed the God is Dead movement. I remember one that said, my God is alive, sorry about yours. And we thought that would answer the problem. But you see, it is not God who was dying, but it was the human definition of God that was dying, and die it is, die it will, and nothing will save it. It is not human life that is evil, it is a distorted religious definition of human life that is evil, and that also is dying. So salvation religion, which is based upon an external God who can miraculously invade life, and a human being who is in need of being rescued, both of them are rapidly becoming inoperative. And as they do, the traditional message of the Christian faith becomes inoperative. The witness of the unity movement is that you, more than anyone else in the Christian West, have grasped this understanding of both God and human life. And you have, consciously or unconsciously, begun to offer another possibility. Perhaps God is not external, Perhaps God is not separate. Perhaps God is not supernatural and judgmental. Perhaps God is one, permeating all that is. Perhaps human life is not fallen, sinful, lost, but simply incomplete, questing toward wholeness, operating negatively out of our distorted unwholeness, which was encouraged by organized religion. We quest toward oneness, and we're constantly pushed out of oneness and wholeness by the religious message of the Christian West. Perhaps we ought to begin to think of human life as part of who God is, and that the job of Christianity is not to bring salvation from an external God to sinners, but to make human beings aware that the God who is the source of life is best seen when we are empowered to live fully. That the God who is the source of love is best seen when we as human beings are freed and loved into the capacity to love wastefully. And where the God who is recognized as the ground of being is seen when you and I find the courage to be all that we can be so that God becomes visible in us. And then from that perspective, we can look back at Jesus and see him not as the divine rescuer, the savior, the redeemer, who comes to pay the price of our sins, an idea that drips with guilt, but that Jesus is rather so deeply and fully human that in and through his humanity, 
we can experience the life of God and the love of God and the being of God, and that this is what the Christian church was always trying to say about him when it said that he is fully human and fully divine, not a divine invader from outer space, not a Clark Kent who's really Superman, but part of the power of life and love and being that flows through each one of us. And if that is true, then the call of the Christ is not a call to go and rescue the fallen or even to convert the heathen. The call of the Christ is to empower the incomplete to become whole. Not to condemn people, but to call them into being what they were meant to be. And perhaps the cross is not the place where the price of sin was paid by the divine invader so that you and I could be absolved from our evil. But perhaps the cross was the place where we were finally able to see the meaning of the love of God, which proclaims that there is nothing you or I can ever do and nothing you or I can ever be that will finally separate us from the God who is love. So that even when we on the cross of Calvary kill the love of God, our experience is that that love continues to embrace us. That's what the gospel is all about. And this, I believe, is also the only doorway into a Christian reformation and into a Christian future. And this is the gift that unity seems to me to have preserved for the whole Christian faith and that unity seems to me now to have to offer to the entire Christian world. I'd like to be one Episcopal bishop who thanks you for it and who says to you that I'm grateful that unity has helped me come to this understanding of God and Jesus and life. And I hope that when my book on life after death comes out, you will see that it is this understanding that also helps me to affirm that life is eternal. So I close by saying to you, leadership people in unity, now it is your vocation to give this gift first to the whole Christian church, but ultimately to the entire human world. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>